Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. Last season we discussed grace and the saving work of Jesus, and before that, heresies, and before that, problems raised by the comments. I've run into a lot of those. However, I have to admit that although I've heard all sorts of reasoning, arguments about truth not being real, or God not existing, or for pity's sake, Jesus not existing, were just never that convincing to me. I just don't think they carry enough weight to pose a significant threat to my faith. No, the problems that I've had trouble with in the past have been less about believing that God exists, and more about learning to trust God, and to trust His will for my life. This is why I devoted so much time and so many episodes to understanding the afterlife. After all, it's one thing to say that someone is objectively good, and another to say that they'll be good to you, or will make allowances for the things you care about in their plan. The two don't always coincide, and I've had a lot of concerns about that. Of course, the Bible offers a lot of answers, but those answers aren't always aimed specifically at the issue I want to understand. Most specific issues have been dealt with by the doctors and councils of the Catholic Church, but there are often specific points that aren't fully explored or are open to being misinterpreted. In the end, even after all the hundreds of years that scripture and church authority have existed, I'm often still left with questions. However, there are a few things that can help provide the needed answers, especially about God and his plan for us. First is Anselmian perfect being theology. I draw on the Bible and church tradition for a lot of information in solving problems about the faith, but when you really want to show that you can trust God in some way, one of the best ways is to try to understand his perfection. The Bible is pretty clear in verses like Matthew 5, 48, Psalm 17, 31, and others that God is perfect. So what does it mean to be perfect? To be perfect is to be lacking in nothing essential to the whole, to have no deficiencies, and to be full and complete. In short, it means needing nothing further. In perfect being theology, this is taken as part of the definition of God, that he is lacking in nothing. God has the fullness of all types of perfection. He is perfect in power, perfect in knowledge, perfect in wisdom and goodness, and in many other ways as well. Therefore, in perfect being theology, you might, for instance, conclude that God isn't going to believe you when you lie to him, because if he did, he would be imperfect in knowledge and therefore not God. Secondly, God is the absolute source of all goodness and no evil. In John chapter 1, verse 3, we read, All things were made by him, and without him was made nothing that was made. Now, at first, I had a problem with this, because it seems to imply that God made evil things as well as good. But St. Thomas Aquinas resolves this in the Summa Theologica, where he says that evil is not a thing as such, but only a lack of goodness which should be present. If, for instance, you have a shirt with a hole in it, it's not evil to make the shirt, even though it may have a hole. The hole is bad, but the shirt itself is not. In the same way, certain things have bad aspects to them, but are not in and of themselves bad things. With that in mind, it's easier to see how God creates only the goodness of things. When they're deficient in some way, that's not due to God's decision to make them that way, but only as a result of some free choice made by some creature to allow them to be deficient. So it's perfectly coherent to say that God is the source of all goodness, and since being the source of all goodness is a quality that a perfect being would possess, we have the support of both the Bible and perfect being theology in drawing this conclusion. God is the source of all good and no evil. Finally, there's the position that goodness goes out from God to other things and people around him, especially to those who are closest to him. And there was a certain woman, having an issue of blood twelve years, who had bestowed all her substance on physicians, and could not be healed by any. She came behind him and touched the hem of his garment, and immediately the issue of her blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who is it that touched me? And all denying, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press thee, and dost thou say, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I know that virtue is gone out from me. Luke 8, 43-46 Some translations use the word power, but I think this one conveys the idea better, because virtue is something specifically good. Jesus is saying that when the woman touched him in faith, goodness traveled out from him into her and healed her illness. 
This shouldn't be surprising. After all, none of us are God, yet we all have goodness, as we discussed in episode 364 on actual grace. If God is the source of all goodness, then there must be some way for that goodness to travel out from him and into us. The simplest answer to this question is proximity, that people who are closest to God receive goodness more readily, like those closest to a star receive more light and heat from it than those who are further away. Now, because God has free will, this is not true in all cases, and it's certainly not just physical proximity, because in the verse we were just looking at, lots of people were pressing close to Jesus, and she was the only one who received a special gift of goodness. Also, we can't necessarily say that people who are spiritually close to God will be showered with good things in this life. Take a look at the personal struggles of a Mother Teresa or a St. John of the Cross for proof of that. And there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Eliseus the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but Naaman the Syrian. Luke 4.27 This is the missing ingredient. God chooses who to give gifts to, to draw them and others closer to himself on the basis of knowledge that only he has. The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. However, while people who are close to God may be deprived of good things for a time in this life, where the salvation of souls is still being worked out, in heaven and hell things are very different. Heaven is the closest one can get to God, and hell as far away as one can get. And in those places, the goodness we receive from God and our closeness to Him are strongly related. Those in heaven receive the greatest goodness, and those in hell receive the least. This final piece of information is especially useful for answering questions about the afterlife. These are the principles I'll be using to examine the problems I've wrestled with, because I think these are a good way to gain accurate information about what God is like and what sorts of things we have in store for us if we follow him. Next time, we'll look at the problem of ourselves and how God's plan affects our understanding of ourselves. That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.